Welcome to Pizza Quest. I'm Peter Reinhardt, and uh, we have a special show today because we're with Joe Carlucci, founder of World Pizza Champions. You, you, you're one of the co-founders of that, right? Uh, way back at the beginning, and yes, uh, and a lot of catching up to do because uh, when I first sort of started tracking you and your career, Joe, was over 20 years ago when we both appeared in a a movie called Pizza the Movie, which was a kind of a fun movie and it was interesting. And, and that was before really, I think it was part of what helped kind of launch pizza in this new era of, I don't know, it's a whole new pizza world right now than it was then. Back then you could feel it verging and there was a lot of talent emerging. You were one of them. And um, and so I so that's when I first kind of became aware of you. But we, we other than the pizza expos, we never really get a chance to talk and connect. So I'm really excited to have you on. But I also want to find out, you know, how you ended up in Alabama. You're a, you're a New York Jersey guy, yeah. And and you have a place now in Alabama for the last four years or so called Valentina's. So and if I'm not mistaken, Valentina's your daughter. Yes, she so, is. So tell us about your daughter first of all, and and how she became the. Uh, you know, the namesake of Valentina's. Uh, well, she's, she's 11. Um, she's in the, well, she's, in other words, she's running the place. <laughs> pretty much when she's here on the weekend, she's 11. Um, she's been in the restaurant business with me since she was born, you know, in the stroller. Um, and then she started washing dishes, all the places, the food trucks and everything that I've done since I've been in Alabama and since she's been born. And I failed so many times with, Joe's world famous, famous Joe's pizza. <laughs> I, I said to myself, this time I'm going to go a different route and I'm going to name it after my daughter. And it's been the best thing I've ever done in my life and a blessing because uh, it's been extremely uh, successful the last uh, three and a half years that we've been open. Our and growth. She's, so she's the good luck charm. Absolutely. 100%. You know, it's, it's something I've noticed in talking to a lot of pizza operators who somewhere it seems like a pizza maker's daughter is always a very critical piece of the of the the, the pie. Uh, either a pizza pie is named after her, or the pizzeria is named after her. It seems like it's almost more important than having a son. Yes, <laughs> interesting. So, so I'm glad that that's worked out. And let's take a step back then and tell us how a little bit about your your journey. How did you end up being you know an East Coast pizza guy and not even get into pizza? And what brought you to Alabama? Well, um, I were I, I grew up in Carmel, New York. It's about an hour north of the Bronx in New York City. My family's originally from the Bronx in Long Island. And I grew up in a real small town called Carmel, New York. And my sister was dating a guy that owned a pizzeria. And it, <laughs> and it was uh, called Redendo's. And my mom worked at the dry cleaners right next door. So she worked there part time. So when I was like 15, uh, I started washing dishes for them. And they were right off the boat. Like they would take the wrappers off the sauce cans and they wouldn't let you know what the sauce was or what the recipe was. And you just had to like kind of go through the grind of learning. Um, and then I made my way up to the front of the counter and then delivering, you know, back then we didn't have Google maps and stuff. We had printed out and we had a flashlight right? You know, look to see what the mailbox number was, hoping the whole number was on the mailbox. Um, <laughs> right. Hoping there was no dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I know I delivered I delivered for Mama's Pizzeria outside of Philadelphia, and it's, it's always an adventure every stop. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. So that's how I got my my first taste of the the pizza world, um, and uh, we worked together for years. I left, went to college, I came back. I didn't really know what I was going to do. I wasn't that book smart type of kid. You know what I mean? I didn't. I was sure. kind of lost back then. Like, you know, so I didn't really know I was going to want to do pizza, but I always knew like whatever I want to do, I want to be the best at. I want to, I want to learn it. I just thought, oh, it's going to be my passion and I want to get up and love what I do. And, you know, nine out of 10 people get up in the morning and go, oh, it's Monday. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm closed Mondays, but I'm that guy that, you know, I live for the day. I love what I do. I breathe what I do. And through the journey of uh, being young and kind of not knowing the pizza industry, uh, we had a couple of places together. It didn't work out. And in 2000, uh, I, I saw this for a competition, you know, how to, yeah. you know, make the U.S. pizza team. And I was like, what's this? And I always wondered, how do you compete with Papa John's, Little Caesars, Domino's? How do you, I, you don't have the money, you don't have the market ability. So I was like, right. imagine I made this team. Mad, you know, imagine the press I would get. 
Yeah. So I drove up uh, to Columbus, Ohio in 2000 in uh, U.S. Pizza Team trials. And I competed against Michael Shepard and uh, a couple other guys. And Tony Gemignani was there and he's my judge. And there's this big smile, this California dude, you know what I mean? Yeah. He was already, even as a young age, was already kind of the guy. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. He's been yeah. to Italy. He's already won. He can't go anymore. And uh, I'll never forget, I was doing largest stretch and um, I was I was throwing it up and Tony looks at it and looks at me and goes, put it down, you won. <laughs> I look at him like this New York guy, you know, and I'm like, I got it. And I threw it up one more time and the whole thing just ripped. And I oh. <laughs> and he goes, oh, Jim. And he tells me about it. Um, he, be he became your uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi at that point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then I went back to the Javits Center six months later and competed and met Siler Chapman, um, who's now my one of my best friends and team members, found a member, co-founder member of the World Pizza Champions. And we both tied in acrobatics and we all went to Italy together. Wow. So you, you so acrobatic dough tossing was kind of your your gateway in before you were competing with the pies themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. it seems like in those early days it was a lot about you know, longest, widest stretch or, or, you know, the, the, the no tossing and all the other things, um, the theatrics more than it was about the pizzas themselves. But as I, I'm sure is what happened with so many other champions at that, in those categories, you wanted to get known for your pizzas and, and not just for your, for your dose skills. So now you're winning for best pies. Yeah. Yeah. And, right. Yeah, for those who are, who are, who, uh, who haven't been following all this and don't know who you are. So last year, you were named Pizza Maker of the Year at yep. Pizza Expo. You won uh, first place in a couple of different categories. And, of course, this is now 20 years after, 20-plus years after you first started. Uh, suddenly, you're, you're sweeping the awards and uh, making the cover of Pizza Today magazine and everything else. So it, a, a long and, and exciting journey along the way. Oh, it's been a long journey, ups and downs, and you know I wouldn't change it for the world. But um, you know I've been compete baking, competing and baking for twenty five plus years. It, that's how long it's taken. You know I'm just blessed yeah. by God to be like, okay, I, I don't have to do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. Well, some of the guys that you mentioned that you met way back then, like Michael Shepard and even Siler, who's still a young guy. Siler lives down the road from me, and he's still I still think of him as kind of like the kid, you know. Yeah. But but he was competing in like from the time he was twenty years old, and. Yeah. Uh, and but a lot of these folks, you know, have have become major players and they're all champions. The pizza, the world pizza champions team that you help kind of organize and be part of uh, is up to like, what, 200 plus members. Yeah, it, it's it. I can't even count how, you know, we, we induct five every year um, and it's just it's been growing and evolving. And we have some great business marketing pizza uh, bakers, artisans from all over the world, not just here in the U.S., well, can you let's talk about that a little bit because um you know i always when i first heard of the the champions team it was like it was the team it was like 8 10 12 people that was the world pizza champions and now it seems like like everybody wants to be on the team and are you did i hear you just say that you only add five new members a year yeah so it's, people have to co actually compete to make the team then no they submit like, okay. like a resume and then uh -huh. we do a review process because it's not just about how great of a pizza maker you are. You know, it has to go beyond that. It has to look like your character, you know, your your whole body of work. It, obviously we want great pizza makers, people that are passionate about it, but you know, humanity, your individual, what you do for your community. I mean, it, yeah. there's a wide range of what we're looking for in a world pizza champion. So and, yeah, it's world uh, pizza champions are ambassadors now for, for the, for the craft and for the, for the, yeah. for the whole, industry for the pizza industry 100 percent, and you know it's it's crazy because to be honest with you tony is kind of like back to the future tony already visioned this 20 years ago okay listen we're on a plane going to italy to compete and and he's talking about this stuff well we're with the u.s pizza team but he's talking about his pizza school he's going to have and how it's going to happen and i'm like i'm like what are you talking about like you know now i'm like i'm just He's like so far ahead. Yeah. We go to Italy. Um, we don't win. We come back. We're in West Virginia. The four of us, Michael, Siler, me and Tony, and we're in a hotel room. 
And Tony says, uh, we're going to make our own team and we're going to be called the world peace champions. And in, I love Tony. Like if it wasn't for Tony, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. He, I owe him my, I'm in debt to him for life. And he said, you guys will, will be the pioneers. He's like, Joe, you're good, but you're never going to be great pizza thrower. Sally, you guys are good, but there's guys that are going to go up and come, but he goes, <laughs> Hey, we're going to start this, um, team and we will be the four founding members with ken bryant who's the fifth um and sean browser came on right after and he says you won't have to throw anymore you don't have to do that he's like just trust me and he saw the vision of where the team is today 20 years ago that's how deep what what tony's forgotten in the pizza world i, I will never know like that's yeah. how, how deep he is and he saw this 20 years ago 20 yeah, plus years ago very visionary. It's interesting because I'm hearing this now for the first time. I've I've heard Tony talk a little bit about it, uh, you know, when he's been on pizzas. Goes, but uh, you gave us details that I didn't even know about the this idea that he that, that first of all you were kind of like independent competitors and uh, teamed up to to go over and represent the United States. Then he then formed your own team, and and that team has now become more than just a team of competitors. It's it's become an ambassadorship, almost like a like a, a, a guild almost of, of pizza leaders. And before social media was even around, Tony, Siler, Mike, and me, and Ken at times when he could, we were all over the world. We were in, uh, we were in Dominican Republic. We were in Germany, West Virginia, Virginia Beach. We would get calls to do festivals and shows. And we would be we like a boy band. The four of us would go. <laughs> yeah. Tony would make sure we got paid, airfare and hotel. And we went all over the place before, you know, TikTok. If they had yeah. all that stuff back then, forget about it. But um, we were going, we were traveling like four to five times a year all over the place because of Tony. You know, and it's just, it's unbelievable. Where and he and so, so now kind of fast forward uh, slowly through the next 20 years or so you were still back based in what in in new york at that point or jersey yeah, i was in new york um i had a uh i think it was two i had a place in i think right when i met tony in 2000 i had a, a restaurant um fresh off the i had a, a pretty bread breakup with my family as far as the business i i don't Time give any advice. Don't go into business with family. It's hard. But my brother-in-law and the, his brothers, we had a falling out, and I opened a place um, in 2000. And uh, I talked to Big Dave about it and Tony. And you know, it failed. It failed in two years. It was my own fault. I wasn't ready. I didn't know the whole business. And you know, I remember calling Big Dave, and he's like, "You'll be fine." And I talked to Tony, and he was like, "Don't worry about it." He's like, "This happens. You, you, you're not. You're going to recover." So I kind of went through a really bad, rough time back then. I was still young and I was still doing the World Pizza Champions. And I met a guy by the name of Bruno DeFabio um, uh -huh. in uh, Jacob Javits Center. And uh, you have to remember, when we go to these shows back then, yeah. we were just on the Food Network. Okay, no one's ever been on the Food Network. So Tony gets us on the Food Network. So we walk in like we're Hollywood, right? Yeah. So yeah. Bruno's from Connecticut. I'm from New York. You know, we're close by. Long story short, he's like, Hey, we got to get together. We get together and we open a place um, called uh, Famous Joe's. Um, little corner spot where nightclubs are. And Bruno puts all the money in and I, I'm the workhorse. And, uh, is this in Manhattan? Famous Joe's? No, uh, this is outside. We didn't do anything in Manhattan. This is in okay. Danbury, Connecticut. And Tony okay. was like, okay. be careful, man. People are going to come after you. People are going to use your name. And I'm like, oh, I'm just, I'm nobody. He's like, no, you're somebody in the pizza world. Trust me. And, uh, that didn't work out you know it went south and it was a really bad one and through that i was always in community i was very close to big dave ostrander and he would be like hey i'm coming i'm going to kentucky i'm going to you know new orleans i have to do these uh openings and they don't know new york style would you want to come and help me and i was like yeah i get to hang out with you learn from you and i could teach him new york style because that's you know i'm from new york and that's what i grew up doing yeah so we were in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, somewhere in Kentucky, and Joe Moore from Tutors in, in Huntsville, Alabama was there. He had already reached out to Tony and Big Dave, and Big Dave was like, well, if you want to come see what I do, why don't you drive over, which is only about five hours. So Joe drives over, and me, him, and Big Dave just go nuts for two days. 
And uh, <laughs> Joe says to me, would you come with Big Dave to Alabama? And I was like, yeah, no problem. So this is like in 2005. Well, it took him like three years, three or four years to, to get that place for whatever reason, right? So in the meantime, I was working with Bruno through that old store and just working other pizzerias in the New York metropolitan area. And uh, Big Dave, as you know, he ended up getting sick. Yeah, Dave, and for those who don't know, who are not in the in the pizza community, you know, like we've been, a lot of these names are very well known when you when you all gather, but not everybody knows that Dave was really one of the leading mentors to so many great pizza makers. And then he passed away, didn't he? Uh, recently, yeah, yeah, yeah a few years ago. Yeah. So, um, I'm still with Bruno, and I'm doing this consulting. I come down here, and Big Dave gets sick, so it's me and Tony. That's it. <laughs> and you want to talk about my cousin Vinny, me, Tony from California, me from New York, and I walk yeah. in. <laughs> and they're like, what the hell did we just hire? You know? <laughs> you oh, just needed Fred Gwynn to walk in the door, you know? And, <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm in the, Tony's in the back teaching them how to cook, and I'm on the front line being my New York loud way. And he comes up to me, he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> what, are you doing here? what are you talking about? He goes, can't yell. I said, I'm not yelling. He goes, you can't do that here. This is the South. He said, you can't <laughs> name that to these kids. They're going to walk out. We're consulting. So lo and behold, I ended up staying two weeks. Tony left after five days. And <laughs> he, they, he wouldn't even get out before it all came crashing. He, he got out real fast. <laughs> yeah. And um, they would fly me back from Vegas because Joe Moore, who's one of the best business people in this industry, um, he would be like, I can't boil water. I can't you know, can you help uh -huh. me do this? So I got very close to the family because I stayed with them for two weeks. So his brother and I kept in touch, assistant, they're like, yeah, we need you back here and help run the front of the store. So as I was transitioning out of the the thing, the whole thing with Bruno, uh, one of the distributors down here said, man, you should get into consulting down here. There's, there's a lot of people that need help. So I said, all right. So the, the Bruno thing just went south and I kind of ended that and literally um on a saturday night i went to see my family at my sister's house and they said oh what are you doing tomorrow i said oh i'm moving to alabama and they're like well i said yeah my car's back they're like when are you leaving like, tomorrow morning they're like yeah right <laughs> and they're like what alabama what you know did they ask you do you even know what a grit is <laughs> yes <laughs> in cornhole you know yeah. corn <laughs> everywhere you go yeah that's, uh, so was there a little culture shock with all that? Uh, there wasn't a little. There was a lot. It's, there yeah, was a lot. Yeah. People saw me coming down. Like, who is this guy? Where are you from? And I'd be like, I'm from my mother. What's wrong? You know, <laughs> I talk. I talk fast. I talk loud. And uh, I drove down thinking I can get into the consultant business down here, and it just was harder than I thought. So I ended up working for Joe Moore as his general manager. Oh. Um and quickly help them elevate their game and skill. And Joe and I were, were perfect together. We're like peanut butter and jelly. Like Joe was the back of the house. He wanted me to be the face. I was, you know, teaching people, bringing things in, ideas that I, you know, had from growing up in New York and he loved everything. His family's from New York. So we clicked really well. And uh, I, it's different down here. It's definitely not New York or California. It's a little slower paced, but yeah. it's, I appreciate it the older I get and, you know, so you've been down, you've been in, in Alabama ever since so, so for over for nearly 20 years now, then? Uh 15 to 2000. And and of course, Alabama has its own wonderful food culture. Uh, you know, between the, the, the barbecue and Birmingham is one of the best food cities in the country. And uh and so you're 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 kind of helping to build something down there or being part of what's being built down there in the food in terms of food community. Sure. So, so let me go back again. So you went through, you mentioned up in, in New York, you had a number of crash and burn situations. Can you talk a little bit about what were some of the takeaway lessons that you learned from your failures? I don't know if you have enough time for that. <laughs> that, that but that's where it all the learning happens, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, ignorance, arrogance, um, too prideful cocky arrogant you think you know everything you think it's from your new york you know everything uh -huh. you think you eat pizza every day or you're from you were born in new york you know pizza um just not evolving as a person or an individual just 
you know, um, and to be honest with you, when I came down here, um, it was the same way for a long time. Um, but, uh, you know, pizzeria guys, you know, they, they, my philosophy now, if we get into it is, is 180 from what anybody thinks or does. I can tell you, I can guarantee you that the way I talk to my employees, the way I treat them, yeah. the way my mindset is. And to be honest, it's been the most successful I've ever been because of, I feel that approach. But back then I wasn't that approach. I thought I knew everything. I thought I was the best. I'd go to the shows, you know, you go to this pizza show where four or five, six, 7,000 people go and they all think you're great. Cause they seen you on a magazine or on the food uh -huh. network, you know, but I learned a lot about people and what they say in my my whole theory is what I say is actions speak louder than words than anything. You you can tell me everything. It doesn't mean anything. It's how you do it, how your character. And, you know, back then I was a little, I don't want to use the word naive, but like, Oh, you have five stores. You must know what you're doing. Just because someone has five stores. You don't know how they're running. They might be robbing Peter to pay Paul in all five. Right. You don't know until you get into it. And when I was in New York, I was in a lot of situations. Um, my my brother-in-laws, you know, they never taught me books back then. They never we did QuickBooks. Everything was with a ledger. Everything yeah. was cash. I didn't know one plus one. We didn't use cash. We used basic cash registers, no cash, no checks. I mean, no credit card, excuse me. It was just cash only, you know? So yeah. we opened, if you really backtrack, we opened another location together and I was in charge of it. And uh, they had borrowed money from, you know, the men in suits, as I like to call them. Yeah, right. I went south and I had a lot of men in suits coming to my house and my my restaurants at times. And it divided my whole family and my mother, and my sister for many years. Um, so it wasn't until really that I got to meet Tony. And even in the beginning of meeting Tony, I was still that arrogance. But there was something about him. He doesn't give up on people. He's an encyclopedia. He's the most giving person. I always tell him, like, you give too much because you always get burned, too, from people because yeah. he's been a lot of people. You know, I just learned, like, to be grounded more, you know, be appreciative yeah. for the, the knowledge that people want to share with you and don't think you know everything because you're learning every day. When you got a chance to travel with the team members, too, as you were building the team and getting to know them, that must be special in a way i mean that it's kind of like having a band of brothers that you can hang out do you do you find that did you did you find that in hanging out with those guys that a lot of the life lessons that you needed were were provided by you guys all sharing war stories yeah except i always they always uh bunked me with tyler <laughs> yeah it was we was, shared the same room together for so they always put us together because we were the youngest but yeah right. you know, michael shepherd's very sharp businessman great pizza guy you know, and I think years and years and years of talking to him, like paid off and listening to him and seeing how he ran his businesses and how he worked with his employees and, and so forth. Same with Siler and his spots. And, you know, of course, Tony. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I think that's a rare opportunity, a rare experience. And and you're creating now with with the growing uh, world pizza team, uh, champions team, that uh, this opportunity for other people to enter into that kind of fellowship with each other. And, and I can see why it's becoming something more than what it started out as. Well, you can't put a price tag on having 50 to 100 plus people pick up the phone and call them for advice. And any one of them will have, if not every one, but some of them will have that situation have, that has happened to them. Uh -huh. So you can always get guidance and advice. Mike Boss, Nick Bogas, Derek Sanchez. I mean, Laura Meyer, like there's so many people that you can call Nicole Beam at any time. These are like the who's who not right now of the American pizza scene. Yeah, and, and they can guide you or say, hey, I went through this. This is what you need to do. Or this is what I did. You can't put a price tag on that. I mean, that benefit is priceless. Well, as long as we're talking about this, and I think some of the people who are listening might be on the outside looking in saying, how can I get a piece of that? How can I be part of what you're doing? How, how would one proceed if they want to become part of the world Pizza, pizza champion, yeah, pizza. They champion. would have to fill out like an application and s send the. Is there a website that they would go to? The WorldPizzaChampions.com, I believe. Uh -huh. Or just Google it, yeah. Yeah, but and then to a site, and then there's there's a form that they would fill out. 
I'm not 100% if there's a form yet. We don't start till next December. But, you know, each member could um, recommend somebody. Like each. So if you if you know someone on the team, maybe you reach out to them. And, you know, I, I uh, Niles Peacock, do you know him? I he's don't. up. Okay, he he's a mixologist, a level two sommelier, and a, 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 a artisan pizza guy in Seattle. Yeah. And wow. Yeah, I came here for a week. Uh, about six months ago and did my whole bar program nice, nice. i didn't even lift a finger and i got to break bread with him he stayed with me and i got to know him as an individual as a person his character you know and um i nominated him you know because of what i know about him so yeah you get with a team member you know if you know them kind of and reach out to them start talking to them and let them get a feel for you and they can nominate you to be on the team that doesn't guarantee you're going to get on right but the way for you to try to to get on and move forward. Well, boy, a guy like Niles brings something else new to the to the group than his all with all his mixology skills and things like that. Yes, and he's he, the the pot the energy that he brings. I've never seen it. The positive energy, the way he turns a resistance from a, a customer or an employee around, remarkable. He absolutely remarkable the energy that he brought to my pizzeria for a week. The positive energy, the smiles. Like it was just you like you didn't want to leave. Like wow. uh, the people, kids loved them. Interesting. No, no, I've now I feel like I gotta track Niles down because you, uh, you have to talk to him because let me tell you something. He goes, You think I'm I'm ADHD? Wait till you talk to him. But <laughs> I, I'm telling you right now, his his character is he, he worked with my general manager three months prior to us moving into the new building saying what kind of uh, martini glasses, what kind of bourbon glasses, what kind of bourbon to get, where's your ABC store, let me see uh, what they have, the wine, what kind of pizzas you can have so I can pair it. He is a human dictionary. He is like Tony when it comes to uh, mixology. He's exactly- And he's got pizza skills as well, which is pretty yes, amazing. Yes, he does. He won an award last year at the Galbani uh, competition. Does he have his own place in Seattle or is he part of a restaurant group up there? He has a place in Seattle. Okay. Do you know the name of it? I'm going to track him down. Niall Peacock's, I think it's with his name. I'm his name's on it. it. So those of you who are listening from the Northwest, uh, you probably know more about it than I do, but uh, sounds like worth worth knowing about. Uh, yeah. But that that's a perfect example. What you just described, that scenario, is a perfect example of what you've created. This The network just keeps getting larger and larger and brings in more skill sets and more talent that then informs everybody else. It's like the perfect situation. Uh, it's like the club that everybody wants to be a part of. Yeah, it is. It's growing. It, it, it is. And it's hard because, you know, you, you don't want to say no, but you, you have to have cap it off and you have to find those people that yeah. connect. You and could. not everybody can get in it, but, uh, and by having a limit of only five a year, it kind of adds another level of specialness to it, you know, because it, it, to get in now, it you got, you got to fight your way in. Yeah, it, it, well, it's getting more popular. Social media. Mike Bosch, uh, who was president for two years, did an amazing job. That guy is like a business encyclopedia in Oklahoma. I mean, he's just amazing what he's done. And now Nick Bosch is uh, Bogart, excuse me, uh, has taken over, and I mean, uh, he's the mastermind of Pennsylvania. But his and place both is. of those names that you just mentioned, Nick and and Mike, are are frequent speakers at Pizza Expo and all the pizza shows. Uh, they again, the, one of the recurring themes and everything you're telling me here is, is that these are people who are all about give back. It's not about just running, focusing on your own thing, but giving back I, to the community. Oh, Mike or Nick, anytime. I mean, they're so humble and they're so grounded. They're always looking to help. They're all about the team. I mean, that's what's made this team so special. You know, yeah. we go, we all go through those good days, bad days, Friday night, this, but the difference from us to everybody else is, and they might have it too, but we can pick up that phone and I can call Mike and he can figure out what I, what, what I did wrong or what we did wrong and maybe give me some ideas and tips and same for Nick. And, you know, you, you can't put it, like I said, you can't put a price tag on that. And, and no, it, it and is. I'm going to go out there and share their knowledge every year at the, the industry to, to help others. Just It just speaks volumes of both of those guys. Well, I, didn't you guys just come out with a book too? The World Pizza Champions just published your, a book, didn't you, of... Uh, recipes from, pardon me. It's called the Pursuit of Pizza. The Pursuit of Pizza, right? And that, I mean, it just came out right the week of the Pizza Expo a couple of weeks ago. I saw it for the first time. Uh, do you have a recipe in there? 
I do. I have the 2022 traditional uh, best in the world. It's called the award winner. When you say best in the world, you won in, in, in there or in Italy with that one? No. So in 2022 in Vegas, I won 2022 best traditional, 2023 best non traditional pizza maker of the year, 2024 best of the best. So the last three years, I've won every one. And now I can't compete anymore. You've, 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 uh, yeah, you, you reached the point where there's nothing left to prove. <laughs> right. Well, so that means that now the next round is you have to be the, the judge of the next generation. Well, I have my, uh, my general manager competed and she placed first in the Southeast and sixth out of 105 people. She was 0.33 away from making the finals. So we're going to bring a Valentina's team, uh, next year to, um, start competing in the bacon since I can't now. Well, that's it. Well, that's it. The, you now have to be the mentor for the next group. Uh, did you get to go then with the team over to Italy and compete at the, in the world championships over there? I, I didn't go. It was just too much uh, from from Vegas. Yeah. No, I don't mean this time. I mean, have you ever gone over with the team? Oh, I used to go all the time. What, yeah. Tony Mike's, yeah, we used to go for years. I, I went how, like 12, 18 years. How different is it competing over there against Italians and people from other parts of the world who – who who also consider themselves to be the owners of the pizza label? Uh, well, um, they don't like Americans. We're not Italian Americans. Are not Italian. Okay, um, they look at look down upon you. I mean, Tony's changed all this through the years of winning in Naples. Yeah, it's hard to get their respect, but um, they have like three or four hundred competitors. There's no prize money. Uh, they just do it for the for the for the bragging rights. Yeah, um, it's it's, it's wow. a different. You know, I haven't been to Parma, but the uh, Salsa Maggiore back in the day, it was in like a, an old soccer stadium, um, and we were kind of looked at as like the outcast. You know, now um, it's evolved more. Americans are winning over there. I mean, they come over here in Vegas and they were winning. You know, so yeah. now that I'm winning and our team is winning more, we've earned. We finally earned their respect. Their respect. Yeah. You know, because they were like, oh, they're pizza tossers. They don't know how to bake pizza. You know, they're not real artisans. Yeah. But yeah. It's evolved now where we are bringing artisan pizza all over the U.S. Interesting. It's very similar parallels that happen in, in the wine industry and in the cheese world where the American wines and the American cheesemakers have been winning now on the world stage as well. Um, and you have, But you have to fight for that respect. You have to earn it. They're not just going to give it. You do. And, and I'll never forget my first competition. I think I came in like 300th. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then I came in like 100th. Then I came 80. Then I came 50th. Then I came 140. I mean, it's all over the board, you know, and, it, and it's hard. Like, you you know, you're doing this competition and you lose and you think you suck and you're like, what am I doing? And Tony's like, you can't measure your success on one competition if you come in last. And if you win, it's, it's great too. You know, it's going to take time. You have to learn yeah. to understand. Yeah. And I think to to really understand that you have to go through the highs and lows and respect everybody because it's a camaraderie too, like when you're yeah. competing. Because as much right. as you want to win, you want your teammate to win. At least but, I do. At least I certainly do. you've one of the it sounds like one of the recurring lessons for you has been, you know, the lesson of humility. And you've got you 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 went from what you described as a self-described as an arrogant sort of, you know, guy to being you know, realizing that you, 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 you learn more from losing sometimes than you do from winning. You learn a lot more from losing a lot more. Yeah. You, you learn a lot more from failing. I think you need to fail to succeed. I think that is so true. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, well then I, I know some of the folks who are listening probably want me to get you to describe a little bit about the pies you won with both the traditional and the non-traditional. So what defines a traditional piece in that category? And then what defines the non-traditional? Traditional is only two toppings. That's all you can put on it. You mean besides sauce and cheese? That's it. Sauce, cheese, and two toppings. Two so toppings. I did, I did a uh, raw bulk sausage and pepper do peppers. And then what What do you think was the difference maker between you and all the other great pizzas that were entered in that category that elevated yours to, to win? What were the, what did the judges see in yours that gave got you the first prize? Oh, it was my dough. Starts so. with the dough. Mm -hmm. and, well then again if you're what can you tell us without without having to kill us what can you tell us about what makes your dough work and so special uh i went down to um texas for four days 
and I spent some time with Derek Sanchez. Derek, I, Derek's I, been on Pizza Quest, yeah. I talked to Tony, and Derek's a big science guy, and he's a doctor. <laughs> he's a doctor, you know? yeah. And uh, I rented my own hotel room every year that I've won. I'll tell you that. And my dough stays in its own room by itself. Oh, that's right. You, I, re I read that, that you, that you actually got a room for your dough at the hotel. It's a science and it's a philosophy and uh, it's worked. I mean, from four years ago, I placed fifth uh, in traditional with the same pizza the following year I won with. And I stuck to the process and I got it down to a science. Like I went going to Derek's for four days and, you know, he helped me with it. And um, it's the dough. The dough has put me over the top every year. Are there uh, things that you're, that you're free to share with listeners of, about either things that have to do with the type of flour or the method of fermentation that you're using or. I use a, uh, I use a non-bleach, non-bromated. This year I use Caputo. Um, okay. And so that was, was that, a, did that make a difference? Do you think you switching to that flour or do you think that you could have won it with, a, a, you know, other quality flours? Um, you know, I've won without it in the past, but I will tell you it was the best pizza I've ever made. And I've talked to some of the judges and it was the one, one of the best pizzas they ever had. And I, Contribute that to the Caputo flour. Uh, was I, it the blue, the blue bag, or was it one the of the Americano? Ones? Oh, the Americano. Okay, so uh, so Caputo has a number of different flours for people who are listening. So that's Americano, the that's the newer flour that they developed over the last few years. Yeah, and uh, Orlando Foods came out here. Um, had um, uh, Mimo, one of the head chefs. I call him Mimo. Yes. Yeah, I remember Mimo. Yeah, and um, just taught me their way, their style with the flour and. and incorporated that with my recipe and um this year i was in the best of the best and i beat the italians i beat two guys from italy that lived there and grew up there and you actually one of the guys that i beat beat me for pizza maker of the year the first year i won traditional so the mm -hmm. year i won traditional i went up for pizza maker of the year and i didn't win i came in second and um that guy was in the best of the best this year and i beat him yeah so is so you're still again i'm just looking for like takeaways and one is says you're still learning after 25 years of doing this you're still learning and getting better every day every day every week every minute you could learn like I, I always say like tony like i'll never know what he forgot and like i said at the show and i said before i'm not the best pizza maker in the world um, I, that day that minute that second that hour i know how to compete but I know in my heart and I know in my head and I'm very good and I'm okay with it that there are a million people out there that make pizza better than me. Mm -hmm. But I also know that I can learn and evolve and try to be better every day. But I know in my heart that there's a million people that can make a pizza better than me. And that the last three years, I know how to execute. I'm great under pressure. I'm great yeah. you know, in com competition, but in no way mean do I think leaving there or being in this store that I'm the best in the world. That's just not how I think. It's not my process. That's good. But you, but that sounds again, like a hard learned lesson for you is to get oh, yeah. that place of humility sure. to, because to, 25 years ago, you would have walked in the room and said, I am the best guy in the room. <laughs> and I'm the best pizza right. in the world. And I'm no, you're right on that one. <laughs> uh, so, 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 so then the non-traditional, what was that? Okay, let me remember because it was lobster, crab meat, um, uh, apple chutney, um, with a um, <laughs> iron parsley, and uh, there was one uh, uh, some kind of spread. I can't remember. I have to ask Cameron, but it was complex. So, so and really, I, it's totally out of the box pizza that that's yeah. not. Yeah, when you say not, I talked to Carmine Testa right before Vegas. And he said it, and I said it. I said, I'm either going to hit first or I'm coming in dead last. Yeah. He, said, he said he said the same thing to me. He goes, you're going to either win it or you're going to come in last because that is such, you know, when you do seafood. Yeah. Hard. But I also knew that if I hit all the points with the ingredients and flavors and then my dough, that I, I, would, I would win. And these and both in the traditional and non-traditional, those pizzas were baked in a deck oven, not in a wood-fired uh, on the night or a brick oven yeah. like that yeah. Yeah, okay, so, so these are decades so these are not neapolitan it's not the neapolitan category it's the traditional category which is different again just for clarifying so there's there's uh there's pan like sicilian detroit 
There's non-traditional, which anything goes. There's traditional, which is sauce, cheese, two and toppings. Two toppings. And then there's Neapolitan. I see. So I told my staff, and I, well, that came with me uh, last year, not this past year. I said, it's impossible for me to win again. Let's just win the Southeast region. That would be cool. It's like no one's ever done that before. So when I won, I was they were looking at me. I actually told them I'd take them to Disney if if I won. So I still told them that trip. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, two of the girls. But they won't um, forget. But you know, a part of me didn't want to win Pizza Maker of the Year because I wanted to see if I can win every every division. And then another part of me said, listen, you got some talent not a lot of talent and you got a hell of a lot of a luck let's just get out of here with the pizza maker the <laughs> call it a day okay we can right. the wish take the win <laughs> yeah get the win and get out you know because i mean it's you don't know what's going to happen in these competitions you know i mean you're going yeah. against 80 plus people sometimes over 100 well you and and everyone has talent and I mean, yes. I've, I've competed in uh, in barbecue competitions, in chili competitions, in pizza competitions, bread competitions, and there's different winners all the time, even though they're the same competitors, because on any given day, yes. you know, somebody puts it all together. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. So I ran out of there with those two awards. And then <laughs> th this year, I, I didn't think I had a shot just because I don't see myself on that level. Um, but uh, I had... Uh, I met another mentor of mine. She spoke to me before and said, if you win, win with grace, lose with grace and gave me a couple more pointers, but it was just, it was, it was great to pull it off three years in a row. So now I'm done. I could be a mentor. I could be a judge. I could do whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's it. That's, and that's the, that's sort of the legacy phase. Now it's the time to leave behind a whole group of, of, of mentees who continue the, you know, the winning tradition. Uh, well, uh, let, let me get you out, uh, you know, on this, cause we, we've led up to Valentina's, your new restaurant there, uh, with your daughter, your 11 year old daughter is even working there now. Right. So, uh, and, and, uh, and she has a lot to live up to, but her name's on the, on the thing. So that means she's, she's running the show oh, yeah. uh, for, for those who get a chance to get your way. What, what are, what's the menu like? What are the pizzas, uh, then the style that you're doing? It sounds like you got a full bar there now. We have a full bar. Um, we do New York, Detroit, Sicilian, cauliflower, uh, and tavern. We're wow. like Chick fil A of pizza. We do not do any pastas. We do house scratch made meatballs, salads, bruschetta, uh, fried goat cheese balls, and some desserts. That's it. That's the whole menu. And we do calzones. That's it. And, and you're in a new location. It's not the original location, right? Then you move. Right. So, how so big I'm of a place do you have? Right now, I think with the patio, it's five thousand. It's four thousand without it, I believe. But um, how many? How many seats, basically? One hundred fifty, one hundred sixty. And so, just to put in your head, I was in a the first spot I was in for three years was my commissary for my food truck. Ah. Uh, and uh, I had COVID uh, was like the best year of my life because I went from lunch and dinner to every subdivision in North Alabama. For two hours, eleven to one, four to six, five to seven, when we had the shutdown. Yeah, okay? I did that for three months, two and a half, and I saved fifty-five thousand dollars cash by plus paying my bills. I took all that money and I cashed it in. I opened the old store, which was fifteen hundred square feet, with a negative bank account, negative with my personal. Like if it didn't work, I was going to work at Walmart. I was done. I'm like, this wow. is it. I, I failed enough. If this doesn't work, you know, I'm not doing it. And um, I did all the pizzas for three and a half years, like every pizza that was made. And not because I don't want people to make it because they can't make it as good as me, but because I have to keep my costs down. I ran 12% labor. I ran a 33% profit wow. and I spent every single dime and I would win. Uh, and this, this is where the whole, thing changed for me on this one and i don't know if it's the name or just hey man you're 40 something years old you can't keep failing in this um i don't know what it was but you know i changed my philosophy on everything that i was doing um from empowering my staff to to you know being in there and watching my numbers more and i hired a, a manager which i didn't think i would need and he he stayed for a year 
and a girl came in and she was interning. Uh, well, she was just passing the bar to be a lawyer. And um, she, she wanted to work. I said, okay. So she ended up becoming a lawyer and still working for me just because she uh -huh. liked it. She did uh, family law, I think it was. And two years into it, um, my manager, my other manager leaves a year into it. And then she kind of starts getting into that role. And she, she didn't like family law because she would go to court and she would see the divide and what happens to kids. So she was just like, she quit. And I'm like, wow, you just went to law school and quit. She's like, it's just not for me. I'm like, well, I need some help. She's like, well, what do you need help with? I'm like, well, I'm building a store and I can't put Legos together. So she starts helping me and becomes the GC of the store. Wow. Literally. And deals with all the contractors and deals with everything. And I was like, okay, this girl's a lot more polished and smarter than I'll ever be. And she basically helped me get this place off the ground. And then uh, the last two years, she's come to Vegas and seen what I want. And she actually gets it when she goes. And not that people say, oh, can I get a picture with Joe? But she sees the bigger picture. So, um, you know, I, I said to her, I said, I want this place to be different. So I want people to feel empowered. I want to have the lowest turnover ratio. I want people to want to be here, but we need to, I look at, I blame a lot of pizzeria guys and restaurant guys for, I don't think there's bad uh, employees and I don't think there's bad kids. I think there's uh -huh. horrible management and bad owners. Uh -huh. I don't, if you give the kids or the servers or the employees the tools, how do you want them to succeed? Yes, it costs more money. But, you know, hogs get slaughtered, pigs get killed. So let's give them the tools. Let's tell them about Detroit. Let's tell them about Sicilian. Let's tell them why our tavern is. Let's make 50 of them and have them come in and taste it and understand the difference of a Sicilian compared to Detroit or, you know, a New York style. Yeah. Um, I, I got the, like the Chick-fil-A model. And and she, she was on board with it. She liked it. And I said, I'm going to give you the keys to the car. You're going to drive it. And I'm going to keep my mouth shut. And it's worked. Uh, the first year she was in, we went 40% in growth. Um, and we're up to 45 employees from going to six employees. Our break room consists of a slushy machine, espresso machine, 50-inch TV, couches. We go to Costco once a month for $700 or whatever it costs for food, um, where everybody can go back anytime and eat before or after. Uh-huh. And I just believe that if you empower the right people and you believe in them and show them that it's not about me, then I, it, it might not work. But for me, it's worked. We have I have 15, how, do you, how do you keep a person like is she a partner now? I mean, how do you keep somebody with that skill set and talent? You know, I gave her I gave her 10 percent. Um, I did. Set, yep. uh, She's got some equity in it. It's, it's so, yeah. Told her if we do another one, I'll put the money up. And she's got asked to be assistant DA in local counties and cities. And <laughs> she just doesn't, you know, she, she runs the show here. You know, she has the office. This is my office. It's a private room that we're in where for people could rent out. Wow. But, you know, I, I listen, I listen yeah. to my employees. I listen to her. I hear what they need and they want. We don't allow cell phones in the building. No Apple watches, uh -huh. black pants, black shoes, black socks. Black shirt, no loop earrings. So we charge an average dinner ticket at my place is seventy two dollars. Wow. Okay, one fourteen inch pizza can range from twenty five to twenty nine dollars, but people pay for it. They pay for them, and it's not because the pizza is great. It's the ambiance. It's the staff. It's their how they talk to them. Yeah. So we do have our ups and downs. Where I'm always trying to be better and better. But we have like a 3% turnover ratio. We offer 401. We offer benefits. I ask everybody to write down as a server, what do you need to make a week? Tell me and we'll make it happen. We're only open um, Tuesday through Thursday, 4 to 8, Friday and Saturday, 4 to 9, and we're closed Sunday and Monday. And we average anywhere from 35 to 40,000 a week in sales. Fantastic. So, so I want go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, then you finish. I just, I, I don't believe, I want to create uh, a career for people. I grew up in New York, New York, working seven days a week, having no life, working Saturdays, Sundays, holidays. And I feel just, it's just me personally. If I'm going to have to open on a Sunday, then I want to be there. Like I, I, it's just something inside of me doesn't see it right for them to be here and me not. I'm not uh, at that point in my life. So I just, we're closed Sundays and Mondays. 
Well, you've you've created a culture there. It sounds like that people want to be a part of, and that that's a big part of this new evolution for you. The growth, the, the in the story that you have to tell, it's really going from somebody who did it the hard way and has learned a lot of life lessons. Love for you to see a book put put a book together of the life lessons that you've learned all over this time. Uh, I'm working on it. Just yeah, right. Me. Good. Yeah, good. I have a publishing company from the pizza book that's going to help me. Excellent. Oh, excellent. And uh, and finding a great partner, finding a, a, a the talent, and keeping that talent a woman like you were describing, who brought a skill set and a talent that that took you years to find somebody who could bring that to the table and to keep her now and make you know give her a piece of the action. It's that's really good. I think it's because like you have to look in the mirror, whether whoever you are as, a, as an owner, and say, what am I good at? You can't be good and great at everything, and you got to swallow your pride and say, okay, you can you know you got to learn how to delegate and find. Nick and Mike taught me that talking to them. Like you have to find your circle. Like we hired a life coach for our staff. He comes in wow. twice. A week. Don't have to tell me whatever's going on outside of that world. Yeah. You're having uh, mental problems, uh, financial problems, or just life. He comes in. I pay for it because I think it's important to have a place where people want to come to but also that we're all human. Like just because I own this place, I don't think I'm better than anybody else. And they don't need to think that I think that, and they're not better than anybody else. I always say, we don't have to like each other, but we will respect each other for those four hours. We don't have to sing Kumbaya, but you know, if I have a pizza guy, like I'll give you a quick 30 second story. I have uh, some Spanish people that work for me and they work so hard. And the other day I threw 15 pizzas out, literally because they weren't, up to the standard. So the girl that's been with me for 10 years goes, have you, she's Spanish. And she goes, have you ever showed them the menu, the prices? She goes, maybe if they understand that they'll take a little more time, they might not work as fast. I said, you know what? You're right. I never sat down with them. I said, let's sit down tonight. You sit down and translate because they don't speak English. So we sat down and said, listen, Joe would rather go a little slower so the quality is better. Look at these prices. Look, look how this is because they came from Domino's and, and they understood it. And I said, you know, I just learned something. Instead of telling them something, show them, hey, this is what the customer is paying for. We want to we want to give that experience with the food, with the server, with the whole the whole thing. But we need you to slow down and make sure every pizza is like you like it should be. Is that what you were referring to earlier when you said the, the Chick-fil-A model? Is that was that what you meant in terms of the culture or when you said when you compared yourself to Chick-fil-A? Is that what you meant? Not the food, but the but the sort of the management style on the culture? Well, both in the sense of uh, I'm not going to bring spaghetti, meatballs or lasagna here. Uh, uh, what does Chick-fil-A do? Chicken. One do thing. Do, chicken. Yeah. Do they do yeah they do, no, yeah. they don't do hamburgers. So you're going to keep do. it focused on the on the thing you do best. Pizza, but also culture. And Cameron, who is the GM, um, did a lot of digging and research. And it Chick-fil-A took everything from the Peabody Hotel in Memphis. Okay, they're back. If you go to their back portal, wherever, however she did it, uh -huh. they grabbed the stuff. Everybody learns from somebody. But um, their whole culture comes from the Peabody. And that's what I want to have, this, this culture. You know what I mean? Yeah, this culture to wear. And don't get me wrong, I I'm, I'm like on top of everything all the time, and I'm probably too nitpicky, and she'll probably tell you that. But yeah, I, I think I believe and feel that culture is the way to be. And I think myself and anybody that owns a place, you can't sit there and blame somebody and say, "Well, I don't have the money to train." Well, whose fault is that? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you can't blame yourself. Like, oh, I don't have it, and then blame the server if they don't have two weeks of prior training, or the pizza guy, right. or the prep person. If you don't show them how to cut basil. Julianne style, like, how are you going to yell at them? If you don't have checklists in place, if you don't yeah. have all the stuff, you, you, you can't, you know what I mean? So I just feel that you, know, you and I think it's exciting that, to, to, as you're describing all this, to know that it's this is not something that you just woke up and suddenly knew. You you had to learn this over a long period of time from the success that came from a lot of failures and a lot of not knowing what not to do. And then and then listening to people and finding the right mentors and the right you know people that could work with you and and it, it, and to put a team together and you've put a team together so this is pretty exciting it's like a 25 year sort of unfolding project that just you keep learning more and more i i think that's pretty cool and a, and a good maybe a good place to end today's conversation because i want to we'll talk about it again in the in the future but uh to for people who are listening to know that 
you know, it takes time and effort and and applying what you've learned to make something like this happen. Absolutely. It does. It, it takes a lot of time. You can't give up and you just got to swallow your pride sometime. I mean, you know what I mean? Pick up the phone, call anybody, call, you know, yeah. and be humble. Well, Joe Carlucci, thank you so much for being with us today. The, the famous Joe <laughs> and all the other Joe variations that you've been over the years. <laughs> it's 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 great to hear. And, and having met you like 25 years ago when you were the kid and we were in this movie about, and one of the lessons of that movie for people who will never get to see the movie that, that we were both in called Pizza the Movie is that one of the lessons was that, that there was a whole big scene of an explosion that took place because of arrogance and youth and uh, but Siler told me and you could reach out to Siler and I don't know if this is true I think he said it's on Apple TV oh really I, I don't I'll have to confirm I'll, I'll look for it I'll look for it okay I'm gonna look for it because the people yeah, can, can see watch it, it again. but because because you and you get to see Tony Gemignani in his youth come almost okay. come to blows with yep. you with with uh someone else is another competitor and uh, and and the people who were making them i was standing next to the guys as they were filming this and up until that point they've been filming for months and months and they even stayed at my house and and the whole time they're going we got all this great footage but we don't know what this movie's about yet and when that moment happened i, I turned to them and i said i think you got your movie now <laughs> and it was it was a great movie and, and uh and it's great to kind of come full circle with you after all these yes, years it is. And i thank you again for having me all right, Joe. Well, thanks. Congratulations on all you've achieved. Thank, Thank you, Cameron, for uh, who helped set all this up uh, for us today. Your 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 GM is she the one you were talking about? Who was the the one who'd been the lawyer before? Or is, That's her. Yeah, so, so Cameron's a, a big part of this, and um, you know, I'll look forward to. You're down. What's the closest city you're in? You're in Matt. You said Madison, Huntsville. I'm like an hour and a half from Birmingham. If you're okay, ever so you're in the so Huntsville, Birmingham, yep, metropolitan area, so to speak. Yes, sir. And it's um and, and the name of the pizzeria is Valentina's Pizzeria and Wine Bar. Valentina's Pizza and Wine Bar. Okay, guys. Uh thank you all for joining us today on Pizza Quest. Joe, thank you for being part of this, and we'll look forward to having you back on in the future. Yes, sir. You have a great day. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye.